world of uncertainty and doubt, faith shines through darkness. It is the unwavering trust in something greater. It gives us courage, connects the seen with the unseen, and empowers us to overcome obstacles. Faith turns storms into opportunities and setbacks into comebacks. It refines us through trials, making us stronger and resilient. With faith, the impossible becomes possible. It fills our hearts with hope, minds with clarity, and spirits with strength. Trust in God. Embrace the journey, for it reveals miracles and realizes dreams. Hold fast to faith, because with faith, we are never alone. stand so we can worship together this morning.
the silence of glory in the highest hope of all creation resting in his mother's arms song on the horizon Set the captives free. He's come to set the captives free. Come set us free. Hope has a name, Emmanuel, the light of the world who broke through the dark. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. Aren't you glad God came to this planet? How many are glad that God invaded the world of darkness? <clears throat> he brought hope, he brought light, he brought forgiveness, he brought reconciliation, he brought healing, all the good things that we enjoy. Every good and perfect gift comes from our Father above. I wanna welcome you this morning. Glad that you're here, glad that you're joining live stream. I wanna just read one verse found in the book of Hebrews. Speaking of the one who we're singing about, Jesus, it says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know what, I'm in a time of need. I want you to know God is here. How do you know God's here, Pastor? I don't see him. Well, he's not visible, but he's here. The Bible says if we gather in his name, he said, I will be here with you. And I believe what he says. And when you act on what he says, something powerful begins to happen. 
God is here, folks. I'm going to share this morning. When God shows up, something is about to happen. And he's here. Amen. So I'm going to ask the altar workers, if you don't mind coming at this time, and if you have a need today, I want you to come to find his grace for your need. Everything I 
And God, as we head into this Christmas season, I just pray that our focus would just remain on you, that we would keep our eyes fixed on you, that we would decide to follow you and no turning back. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's so good to see you all here today. Why don't you turn and greet those around you and welcome them here as well. Hello, and welcome to Living Stones Church. Whether you're with us in person or joining us online, we're glad you're here to spend part of your weekend with us. We invite you to fill out a Connect card to send your prayer requests or tell us if you need any information about LSC. For those joining us online, you can fill them out at livingstones.ab.ca slash connect. If you want to give today, you can do so at the Information Center right after the service. For information on all of our giving options, including e-transfers, click the Give button on our website. Our cafe is open today following both of our morning services. We invite you to come down to the Fellowship Hall and get to know one another. Our menu is posted on the bulletin board on your way down to the cafe. Our feature items on the buffet this week are creamy chicken, mushroom and bacon, and stuffed pork loin. This week's dessert feature is red velvet cupcakes with cream cheese icing. Everyone is invited to join us as we celebrate the birth of our Savior on Sunday, December 24th. Join us in person or online for our Christmas Eve services at 9.30 a.m., 11.15 a.m., or 1 p.m. Cookies and cider will be served after each service. This is an excellent opportunity to invite your friends and neighbors. Invitations are available in the foyer. Sunday, December 31st is New Year's Eve, and we hope you will join us for our Winterfest celebration in the Fellowship Hall. We will host a potluck supper, board games, and ice skating in our courtyard from 4 to 8 p.m. Bring a board game and a main dish, salad, or dessert to share, and invite your friends and neighbors. Please note our 6 p.m. service will be canceled so that everyone can join in on the food, fun, and fellowship. Check out our website for more information. Start 2024 with Freedom Session, a powerful healing discipleship journey, inviting you to rewrite your story with a God-inspired ending. Through biblical teaching, small group discussion, and personal reflection, Jesus will heal your heart and empower you to live a life of freedom and purpose. Freedom Sessions start on Thursday, January 4th and runs for 20 weeks. Register online by December 17th. Hey, thanks again for hanging out with us this weekend. If you have questions about anything you've heard today or want to know more about LSC, stop by the Information Center or visit us online. If you're new here, we want you to feel right at home. So we invite you to stop by guest reception kiosk after service. We have a gift for you and we would love to meet you. With that being said, I'm going to dismiss middle school youth and pass it over to Pastor Paul. Go ahead. Len, Len is uh, one of my prayer partners. He just feels they have a special word f- from the Lord for us today as a congregation. Your common, your common everyday life means something to me. Every offering given, every tithe given, every marriage, every act of forgiveness, mm-hmm. every act of justice toward a neighbor brings honor and glory to my name. And because you know my name, I will protect you, and because you do that, I will f- answer any question you have. And when people watch you, they will know that I'm Creator, Lord, and Redeemer. Thank you, Lamb. <clears throat> amen. Let's be encouraged, amen? What do we hear? God is watching us. He's rejoicing over us as children. Isn't that beautiful? When we do the right things, we honor God, and God will honor our lives for doing those things. Well, why don't we stand, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I want to pray today. This message has a very positive title, and it is a very positive message, but we're going to speak on crisis. Anybody experience crisis in your life? You know, I'll say this, crisis comes to all of us at different moments in our lives. Isn't that true? So how are we going to handle that? We're going to talk about that this morning. So maybe you're here today and that's your experience. You're in a time of crisis. This is a season in your life that you're in crisis. 
I believe you're here for a reason. And I'm gonna ask God's gonna speak, especially in your soul, but for all of us, because I think we need to prepare ourselves because in this life, we will have crisis. We will have trials. We will have troubles. So Father, I thank you this morning. You're a gracious God. And we heard that you're an affirming God, you're an encourager, you're the lover of our soul, you designed us, you created us, and Lord, you are now going to instruct us in your ways. Lord, give us a heart to hear your voice. Help us, Lord, to receive uh, words of encouragement and comfort and, and words of instruction, words that will help us understand and be challenged by what you're communicating to us today. Father, help us to not just hear your words, but Lord, help us to act on them. And that's what brings about real change in our lives. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. Young mother who had rebelled against God in her Christian upbringing wrote the word, these following words, just a little snippet. She said, on January the 5th, 2009, by my daughter's graveside, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I had prayed with a pastor of a local church earlier we had never really been a part of, and I'd been thinking a lot about God since that day that Taylor left this earth. The moment came at the burial where I thought, this is it, I need God right now. And at that moment, it all came to me. Taylor was sent here from God to change not only my life, but my family's life. How many know there's nothing like life and death situations that causes us to rethink life, change some of our priorities? Crisis is probably one of the most fundamental means that brings us to a deep realization that you and I are weak, we're needy, we don't have all the answers, we need help. I believe it's designed and ultimately to bring us to a faith in a loving God, faith in a Savior who cares deeply for us, and I believe it's designed to bring transformation in our lives. God is interested in bringing about change within our lives. Randy Alcorn, in a book entitled, If God is Good, it's basically you know, trying to answer the questions, you know, if God is so good, why does God let bad things happen to us? That's a great concept. And he, and he writes in this book, he said, you know, armies and hospitals have chaplains. Political victory parties and ac academy award celebrations do not. He goes, why? Because hospitals and battlefields are offering us a clear view of death while celebrations tend to obscure that. Death seems to draw our attention to what really matters, the state of our soul and the God and people who will outlast this life. It's all about people, folks. Death is a wake-up call, a reminder that our time here is fleeting and every one of us, well, we're all gonna die. As a matter of fact, Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse two says something very profound. It says, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone, and the living should take heart to this. And then it goes on to say in the next verse, better is the day of death than the day of birth. You know, when I first read that, that's kind of a shocking statement. How many say that's kind of a shocking statement? Better the day of death than the day of birth, why? Because when you've come to the end of the journey, you don't have to live through all of the things that you do when you start the journey. And how many know that when you start this earthly journey, there's gonna be some moments of pure joy, great moments, pleasurable moments, but there's also gonna be difficult moments, painful moments, challenging moments, crisis moments. And you know, at the end, you don't have to face any of those moments because if you're a child of God, guess what? You're gonna slip into eternity where there's no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more loss. How beautiful is that? You see, death can be a compass to recalibrate our bearings in this life. Often we avoid the issue, we don't take it into consideration. And what happens so often is we begin to become engaged only in this life. The seduction of our society's prosperity, it dulls us to the ultimate realities. You know, God spoke to the people of Israel in the book of Hosea when he said, 
When I fed them, they were satisfied. And when they were satisfied, they became proud. And then they forgot me. You know, the great temptation in a time of good times and prosperity is that we forget God. How many know that's true? And it's in a time of adversity and difficulty that we're reminded we're weak and we need help that we tend to pray more and cry out to God. So, you know, when trials come, when struggles challenge us, we need to realize, we need to mature to the place where we see them, not as an enemy, but as an ally to help us to continue our spiritual development, our growth in God. Too many people question, you know, when bad things happen, you know, uh, you know, where is God in this? Or does God really love me? Or why would he allow this in my life? But rather than seeing a trial or a crisis as a negative thing, which we tend to do, maybe we need to change our perspective. Because, you know, a lot of times we can't change our circumstances, but we can change our attitude. And how many know when you change your attitude, it literally changes your emotional state of being? Think about it. This is what James tells us. He says, Now, I want you to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, I know that's exactly how all of us respond, right? You go, oh, isn't this wonderful? Pure joy. We don't think like that. But James is gonna explain to us why we should consider them more favorably than we do. He goes on to say, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. It's gonna do something to us. It's gonna create something in us. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What is he saying? He's saying trials have an ability to help us develop, grow up, mature. You know, a lot of us, we just, we, we don't want to develop. We, we'd rather just live in a comfort zone. We want everything to work out in our lives, right? Come on, let's be honest. And then the trial comes along, we go, ha. Ah, why is this happening right now, right? But James is saying, listen, God has a plan. You know, it's a tool to strengthen our faith, to mature. Listen, I'm gonna say this, that the trial that you're facing right now is designed to help you to face a bigger one further up ahead. You go, Pastor, that's not very encouraging. <laughs> but it is if you think it this way. He's giving you the ability and the, the, the spiritual strength that when it happens, it's not gonna crush you. You're going to be able to motor through the things that are before your life. And eventually, we're going to be in eternity. Randy, Randy Alcorn reminds us in the same book, he says, to hate suffering is easy. To hate sin is not. And what God wants to do is switch that. That you and I get to a place where we actually hate sin and we don't get so worried about suffering anymore. The natural man draws back from suffering and he embraces sin. That's the unregenerate. That's a non-transformed soul. It just, you know, that's what people want. They, 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 they want to embrace sin, but they want, to, they want to avoid suffering. Whereas when we grow in our faith life, we begin to see the value of the struggles that cause us to see this life as it really is. This is a facade. You know, this, this life Sometimes we, 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 we're trying to live, you know, and say we want to live and experience everything to its fullness. And, and I do believe that we can have, in a sense, joy and peace and hope and grace in this life. And we can enjoy this life, but let's not kid ourselves. It's a broken world. And there's sin in it, and there's suffering all around us. And if you're not suffering, you know somebody who is. Isn't that true? You can't get away from it. The spiritual man sees the nature of sin as it really is. To see past sin seductions and realizes the depths of despair that sin produces. You know what I notice? When we become self-focused, when it becomes about us, we become more unhappy. Isn't that true? And when we realize it's about God and it's about others, and it's about an opportunity to serve God and serve other people, we get far happier. It's amazing. We get outside of ourselves, and Jesus talks about that, you know. When we have the right attitude, suffering does not define our lives anymore. As a matter of fact, Peter says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. 
And as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for human or for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. In other words, what he's saying is that suffering is one of God's tools in this world to move us from a self-centered you know, life to a life where we now don't just live for our own evil desires, but rather we start to live to fulfill the will of God in our lives. It moves us off a dead center, which is ourselves. So God uses it as a tool. Now, in our text today, we're gonna find a man coming to Jesus, and I'm gonna tell you right now, he would have never come to Jesus if he hadn't been in a crisis. And I'm gonna say something to you. I probably would have never come to Jesus if I had not been in a crisis. And there's probably a few other people in this room would say, Pastor, that's so true about me too. I would have never come to Jesus if I had not been in a crisis. But the crisis brought me to Christ. And that's powerful. His broken, uh, you know, I think Christ still brings people to Christ. Still does it today. The main purpose of John's gospel is to bring us face to face with Jesus and what happens when we encounter him in the various circumstances of life. Crisis can help us realize who he is and what he has come to bring us, which is simply new life, a different kind of life. Now, last week we kind of concluded where Jesus was traveling through a region called Samaria, and we came to this little town called Sychar, and a woman, the least likely person, Jesus revealed himself to her as the Messiah, and she told the village, and everybody got to know Jesus, and the last verse in that chapter is so beautiful, uh, that, that episode, it says, and they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. That's such a beautiful confession, isn't it? We're Samaritans, but we know that it's not just for us, it's not just for Jews, it's for everybody in the world. Jesus is the savior for the entire globe. I love it. But now we, Jesus is now gonna enter into his own region, Galilee, where he's lived most of his life. And he brings us back to our text here, and he says, after two days, he left for Galilee. The very next verse is fascinating. It says, now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. You know, I've come to a deep realization. I've never picked up on this before in all my readings through the Gospel of John. But every time now I'm seeing these parenthetical thoughts, these little parentheses where they put a little information in, very important. It's actually going to give us a deeper understanding of the coming story and the last story. Actually, I sh it's actually showing a comparison between the attitude of these Samaritans whom Jesus came, he was a Jew, they had all kinds of reasons why they may not have connected to him, but they responded to him and Jesus never did a miracle there. Isn't that amazing? They just believed. But now we're coming into his own area. It says when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. And then we get the reason why. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem and at the Passover feast, for they had all been there. In other words, they'd seen the miracles Jesus had done. So they were excited. Come on, Jesus, let's see it, you know? And so that's kind of the, the background to the incident that we're gonna find. We're gonna find, I believe, some powerful steps that lead from crisis to transformation. And I'm only gonna give you two, and here's what you need to know today. If you're in crisis, these are the same steps for us. Number one, it's designed to bring us to Jesus. Your crisis right now in your life is designed to bring you to Jesus, and we're gonna see that. Difficulties, pressures, disturbing situations, many times they paralyze us from doing anything, and and but they're really designed to cause us to move wholeheartedly towards Christ. You know, John Maxwell shared in a message once, and I, I took this note down. He says, we've all succumbed to our emotions at one point or another, and we will again, and probably soon. He said, we're emotionally hooked, and when your emotions are in control, you can no longer think logically. You've become emotional. And you know, crisis have a t has a tendency to create high degrees of illogical emotion. There's no amens, but that's true. We know that's true, right? 
And how many know surrendering to our emotions in panic mode does not bring about a healthy solution? No. So you got to go get your emotions under control, number one. Now, our first response in a crisis should be what? Turn to Jesus. Turn our hurt over to him. Turn our confusion over him. Come to him in our, with our pain. You know, Peter reminds us that we're not to let our emotions go unchecked. As a matter of fact, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, he says, cast your, all of your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. So some of you right now, you're battling anxiety. You need to bring it to Jesus. That's where you need to go with this stuff. He goes, be self-controlled. Get your emotions under control, he said. Be alert. Your enemy, the devil's prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What does that tell me? We're in a spiritual battle. Why are we shocked that there are difficulties in our life and we have a spiritual adversary? Just a thought. And you know, if I'm doing what God wants me to do, I'm gonna be engaged in this battle. Because if you're really walking in God's will, you're having an impact for the kingdom of God and the enemy hates that and he's gonna do everything he can to impede your walk with God. He's gonna do that. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of what? Sufferings. Oh, this is not, oh, I'm the only person suffering. You know, when we look over this, almost eight billion people on the planet, there are people, believers, suffering all over the world. And we are, some of you are suffering. The suffering in other parts of the world are different. But every believer, you're not immune from these things. That's what we need to understand. He goes on to say, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have what? Suffered qualifies a little while. Thank you, Lord. How many go, thank God it's not endless, right? A little while will himself restore you and make you what? Strong, firm, and steadfast. So what was designed to destroy, weaken, discourage, God is saying, no, 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 no. If you come to me, you bring the stuff to me, the end result will be you'll be stronger, you'll be more completely committed, firmer, and you will be more steadfast. You'll have grown through the experience. That's what he's telling us. So we develop spiritual muscle. Now let's pick up the story. Once more he visited uh, in Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. Now, the royal official, that means this person's in the king's court. Well, that would mean he's probably working for Herod Antipas. There was three Herods at the time. Remember, the, grand, the, the father had died and it was separated by his sons and he named them all Herod. Isn't that? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, right. But this is Herod Antipas. He's in the northern part. And so the royal official, so what it's telling me is, He's probably not somebody that's really that interested in, in what's going on in a sense in the ministry of Jesus. He's not a follower of Jesus. But how many know when you, when you have a crisis, it, you, know, you start thinking differently? And so Capernaum is about 25 miles from Cana. And when we, when, when we learn from John that when he hears that Jesus is nearby, rather than send a servant, this tells you how critical the situation is, he himself goes. He could have sent a servant, but he didn't. Now, he comes to Jesus because he's desperate. And I think desperation causes us to do desperate things. His son is dying. And he's, he's probably done, done everything he can think of, and he doesn't know what to do. But he hears that Jesus is healing people, so I'm gonna go talk to Jesus. I'm gonna try to drag him to my house and see if he can do something, right? Uh, now, we know that crisis doesn't always lead to faith but it can lead to stronger faith if we can move past the pain in our life. You know what we get fixated on? Our problem. How many say that's true? We get fixated on our pain. It's understandable, it's, that's human nature. But uh, what we need to do is get our eyes off the problem and begin to look to Jesus for the answer. And there's so many great stories that bring this out. You know, Peter was, 
a walking on the water. Remember the winds and the waves came? He took his eyes off Jesus. He took it, put it on the wa- winds and the waves. What did he do? He started sinking. That's a, that's, a, that's a metaphorical lesson to all of us that you and I need to keep our eyes on Jesus in the middle of our troubles and not let them drown us and overwhelm us. John Maxwell, years ago, he was speaking on a, a, a motivational tape on how change comes about in our lives. And he said there's three times that change is enacted in our lives. And here they come. Number one, we, when we learn enough that it empowers us to change. Number two, we heard enough that it motivates us to change. Or number three, we grow enough we're able to change. Very interesting. But how many see sometimes we have to hurt before it motivates in order to change? And hopefully, you know, one of the beautiful things about, you know, I, I'm going to advocate for, you know, why it's so important to be in church every week. Because you're learning and it's empowering. And you're growing. Amen? Amen? And sometimes, you know, when you have this information, then it helps you so that you don't come unglued when the problems are hitting you because you've got the information to how to respond in that situation. And you may not be in a crisis right now, but this is good information to help you so that when you get to the moment of crisis, you go, oh yes, run to Jesus. That's the right response. And then we'll give you the second one in a moment. Prayer is always this first step away from the problem and pain that ultimately brings us to a place of surrender to Jesus. So when the man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee uh, from Judea, he went to him and he begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. You know, in the Greek verb in our text, this idea of begging, uh, well, first of all, there's certain tenses in, in the Greek language, and the active present tense is kind of the emphasis, okay? So what's the active presence? First of all, it says, when Jesus had come. Jesus was coming. When Jesus comes, you can expect something to happen. When Jesus comes into a situation, change, it's on its way. I like that. How many say, let's bring Jesus to the situation? Let's get him here, Right? In our lives, in our thinking, in our minds, in our hearts, when we're praying, we're connecting, we're crying out to God, what we are doing is bringing Jesus to the situation. It's gonna have an impact. The man comes to Jesus and he starts begging. Hmm. Again, what we need to understand is that faith in God makes what is impossible, possible. You know, God's moved by faith. Faith pleases God. Matter of fact, Hebrews tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him, number one, has to believe that he exists, first of all, and that he rewards those who, what? Earnestly, earnestly seek him. There's a a passion about this thing. We're we're not gonna let Jesus go. And I I think of the story of the woman whose whose daughter was tormented by demonic spirits and and she was not a, not a Jewish lady. He was up northern part of Israel there, up in the uh, near Tyre, Phoenician ter- territory. And, and uh, you know, the Bible, she's crying out to Jesus to do a miracle. And, and this is what Matthew tells us. He didn't answer a word. How many of you ever felt like God sometimes doesn't answer? You're praying and nothing's happening. How many of you ever had that experience? It's like Silence. So his disciples came to him and he urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. You know, well, eventually Jesus does respond. Why? Because she's persisting in her cry. That teaches me a lesson, persistence. Then the woman came and knelt before him and said, Lord, help me, she said. Jesus now responds to her. He's not silent anymore, but he gives her this answer. That's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Uh, how many go, that's not the answer I want. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I have a need here, and you're telling me you're not going to do anything. I am not letting you go, Jesus. I, this is so critical that you do this. So what is, what is, she, what is uh, her response to this? Most of us would go, okay, walk away. No, she comes up with a response. Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. In other words... <laughs> Yeah, that's true, you know, you're not gonna give us non-Jewish, non-covenant people what maybe what belongs to your covenant God, but listen to me. You know, 
the image that Jesus used of crumbs coming off the table, she goes, I like it, I'm seizing to that. And even the dogs get the crumbs from the bread. They may not get the full meal deal, but they're gonna get something. And I need something from you. And Jesus, yeah, it's so beautiful. He says to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. The very hour. How many That's beautiful. What was Jesus doing? He's drawing faith out of her. What their trials and crisis designed to do? Draw faith out of us. What's in you will come out of you. And if you are developing your faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We're developing this faith. What happens? We start seizing the promises of God. We start hanging on. We start you know, appealing to God's very word back to him. And it's powerful. So what's Jesus' response to this nobleman? He says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. Got to go back to that parenthetical thought. It said that this prophet is without honor in his own country. What Jesus is basically saying is, all you guys want to do is see miracles. You know, thinking back to what had previously happened, there were no miracles and people believed in him. Now he's in his own home region and people don't really believe. And I believe that Jesus knew that this man didn't really believe that Jesus was anybody of any significance. All he had was a need and he knew that Jesus was capable of healing people. That's all he was concerned about. That's interesting, isn't it? Here we see John is making that comparison between the Samaritans and the Jewish people living in Galilee. And Don Carson says, the welcome of the Galileans displayed was so dependent on miracles, unlike the faith of the Samaritans. Therefore, on visiting Canaan and being petitioned to perform a miracle, Jesus detects in the royal official a welcome and a faith that desires a cure, but that does not fully trust him. How many know there's a big difference between asking God for your help a, a temporal help rather than an eternal saving faith. Do you know there's a big difference? I've met a lot of people, would you pray for me, I want this. Would you pray for me, I want that. But they're not asking, I wanna know God. They're not asking, I wanna surrender my life to God. I just have a need, I want God to fill it. Come on, a lot of people you know, come to the church, please help us with this, please help us with that. But they're not saying, please, I just wanna know God. That's a different cry altogether. Indeed, the royal official in Jesus' view exemplifies what is wrong with the Galileans as a whole. Jesus' rebuke is in the plural. So he's not just addressing the, this, uh, he says, unless you people. He didn't just say, unless you see miraculous signs. He says, unless you people. There must have been people standing around when he said it. He was actually speaking to his countrymen. He was speaking to his peers. He was speaking to the people in Galilee. You guys are only interested in the miracles. You're not really understanding that these miracles are signs to point you to a greater reality. And that Jesus is actually the savior of the world. That's the greater reality. In other words, the royal officials desire and want for a miracle is motivating him, but once his desire is want is met, will it address the greatest need in his life? That's the real question. You see, I don't know. Did I say this last week? I can't remember. Sometimes I'm, you know, I'm, I speak a number of times and I go, where did I say this? But I've been doing this little course on editing. And I discovered something about writing. You have to have tension. That may, that's obvious, right? Keep the reader interested. And one of the things that is presented, especially in fiction, is the idea that you have a character who has a want. And what you're trying to do is help them come to a realization that what their want is and what their need are, are two different things. And that's part of the tension that you create in a protagonist. I thought this was very fascinating because what this editor said is every character has a flaw. And what you're really doing is developing and helping the character develop in front of your eyes as a reader. You're seeing that happen before you, that they think this is what I really want, but in reality, either they receive it or they don't or whatever, but they come to the conclusion in their life that what they really needed was something totally different than what they thought they wanted. And I really am convinced that's true of most people. 
We think we know what we want in life, but what we really need is something far different. And I'm going to argue that a lot of people think they want this kind of a life. They want this kind of a situation. They, if I'd only have this, I'd be happy. And that's not true. What they really need is to know God personally and to have the greatest need in their soul met, and that's union with God. And that changes the way we live. We now begin to have eternal life, which is not a life that begins when we die. It's the kind of life we receive when Jesus comes into our life. It's a life of peace and joy and hope and love and grace. And it changes the whole direction and orientation of our lives. It's very powerful. So will this miracle bring this man to faith in Jesus as the savior of his soul? Will he, will he come to serve Jesus, not for what he receives, but because of who Jesus is? This is the question Jesus is raising, not only for that royal official, but he's raising that question to us. Not only the people in the province of Galilee 2,000 years ago, it's a question he's raising to you and me. Why are you serving? What you can get out of it, or for who I am? Do you see? Do we serve him for what we get out of it or because of who he is? Will we serve him at whatever cost to ourselves? Do we have a superficial or a genuine faith? And why am I saying this? Because trials have a way of answering the question. You see, when it's starting to cost you something, when you're going through a difficult time, instead of you know, giving up on God, that's just telling you, you, it's, it's an indictment to the person. It's, it's not that God is bad. It's showing you where you're really at. When, when life is not making sense, when I don't understand, when I feel forsaken, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm going through this difficult time. Do I have an understanding in my life that, God, you are so real? Yes, I do not understand. Do you know, I preached the entire book of Job, and as I was going through that series, I had this epiphany moment at the end when Job is demanding, he's demanding, he's mad at God. He wants to put God on trial. He says, I've done everything you've wanted me to do, and my life is a mess. What point is it in serving you? I want to put you on trial, God. I want to ask you these questions. Why are you letting this happen to me? This is kind of sounds like a person in crisis. Guy goes, before I answer any of your questions, Job, I just have a few for you. Okay? Where were you when I did all these things? By the time God gets done asking the questions, Job realizes how foolish he had been. He said, God, that was unwise of me. Forgive me. And then I raised the question, I said, what would you rather have, answers to all of your questions, or would you rather have the presence of God in your life? Because you see, when God's presence is there, we don't need all the answers. What we need is the presence of God. I'd rather have God's presence in my pain and my difficulty than have all of the answers to my problems. I'd rather have him. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. God came to Job. I love that. God wants to come to us in our crisis. Now the official says to him, come down before my child dies. Okay, let me move on to the second step. Whoops, one, one, one too far, let's go back. Two steps, one, it brings us to Jesus. Two, it brings us to faith in God's word. In other words, here's where the next, you know, we, yeah, we're good about maybe coming to Jesus. Maybe we're good about praying about it. But listen to what Jesus says to this man. I think we're gonna learn something. When we act on the word of God in obedience, it means we're really putting our trust in God and something begins to happen. As a matter of fact, you know, the Bible says this in the book of Romans that faith actually comes from hearing the message and it's heard through the word of Christ or Hearing comes by hearing God's word. Now notice what Jesus does. He challenges this official to act in faith. He says to him, go, your servant will live. Sorry, your son will live. Go, your son will live. Wow. Now, Merrill Tenney brings out the possible conflicting emotions in the heart of this father. 
By dismissing the official with the statement that his son was alive, Jesus creates a dilemma of faith, which is, I think, good. If the father refuses to go to Capernaum without taking Jesus with him, he will show that he didn't really believe what Jesus said and probably wouldn't get any benefit from you know, his unbelief. But on the other hand, if he followed Jesus' order and began to return to his dying son with no outward assurance that he would recover, he was now forced to make the difficult choice between insisting on evidence and thus showing disbelief and of exercising faith without any tangible proof to encourage him. You see the dilemma? He's now in a dilemma called the horns of the dilemma. And we all get to this place. Are we going to trust God or not? Right? Now, other writers come in a different way, and they say uh, the fact that the father left was an expression of his confidence in Jesus' words. But <clears throat> let's take a look at what happens. The man took Jesus at his word, and he departed. So he did act on what Jesus had said. I think that's a challenge for us today. Will we act on God's words? Well, what happens if I don't know the words? Well, then you don't have anything to act on. This is one of my great arguments why we should all be daily Bible readers. We need to know what it says so we can act on those words. And you know, the more you study the scriptures, the more you read them, the more they get inside of you, the more it begins, you begin to walk in obedience and do what it says. Pretty soon, you start walking in a certain way. You start thinking in a certain way. You start behaving in a certain way. Eventually, it becomes a part of who you are. Does that make sense? You, after a while, you're not even thinking about it. You're just doing. You're doing the right thing because you've been feeding this stuff so long in your heart and mind that it becomes a natural outflow now of how you're living. It's very powerful. It's coming from within. The change and the transformation is coming from within. Then he, he's, he's on his way home, and it says, while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that this boy was living. Okay. Now, Craig Keener, who's a, New Testament scholar, he says this, is, is it possible that John intends the restoration of life here as an allusion to Christ's gift of eternal life? And I think the answer is yes. And the reason being is because usually the word that is translated eternal life is actually translated in this text of scripture. He is living. It's not just he's physically living, but there's something even more dynamic being conveyed here. He's experiencing the kind of life that God wants to give. I like that. Do you know there are a lot of people that are physically living, but they're not living at all. They're spiritually dead. They're alienated from God. They're lost in their trespasses and sins. Their whole life is focused in on themselves, and they're embracing the values of the society because that's all they have to embrace. But Jesus has come to give us life, and that more abundantly. It's a quality of life. Eternal life is a quality of life where we walk in joy and hope and peace. Now, father says to the servant, he inquires as to the time when the son got better, and they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. And the father realized that this was the exact moment, really, time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. The moment Jesus spoke, his son was restored. How many go, that's powerful. The moment Jesus said, your son will live, immediately the fever left him. That's how powerful God's word is. And he said, go, go home. He's okay. And he acted on God's word. So what was the outcome of this? So he and his whole household believed. What do you mean they believed? They believed that Jesus wasn't just a healer, but that Jesus was the savior their savior, the Messiah. This miracle led them to faith. That's what, that's what it was designed to do. Now, this miracle was designed to bring a life-transforming faith into their lives. Do you know, I've said it, our crises are designed to do what? To transform us. That's what they're designed to do. We can see the positive outcome here that led to faith. But what happens when we don't, what, what we desire doesn't materialize? How do we handle things when things don't improve or maybe they get worse? Okay, how do we handle those moments? When we don't understand what's happening, 
The trial is still designed to bring us to Jesus. Job, I said already, had that encounter that changed his understanding of God and ultimately changed him. I think God is interested in changing us. How many of you right now are going through a great trial? What are you going to do? And here's the answer. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Persist in your cry. Despite setbacks, silences, and discouraging circumstances, persist. We need to keep, remember the woman. She persisted. The results are going to be a stronger faith in a transformed life. That's what happens. Let's stand. So with every head bowed this morning, maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know, Pastor, I am walking through a crisis moment. And I'm saying to you this morning, run to Jesus. I'm saying to you today, persist in your cry to him. Allow that difficulty and that crisis and that challenge in your life to be the thing that becomes the strengthening agent in your soul, that you're going to get through this. You know, I love that hymn, Amazing Grace. There's a line that goes as you sing along, stanza two. Through many dangers, toils, and tears, I have already come. Listen, there's going to be dangers up ahead. There's going to be toils, that's work, and there's going to be tears. There's going to be suffering and sorrow. Through many dangers, toils, and tears, I have already come. There's no less days than what we will sing God's praise. Isn't that beautiful? See, God can keep us to the very end. How do you know that? Because he's the, the author and he's the completer or the finisher of our faith. Folks, this is a long run. This is a lifetime run. You know, sometimes, I, you know, I've, I've been a pastor a long time. I've seen Christians start up and go, and then all of a sudden they flag out, and I don't know where they end up, some of them. They just, you know, they got disappointed. You know, they took offense. They did all kinds of stuff. You know, I, I keep thinking to myself, you know, there's a verse of Scripture. When I was a new Christian. It said, I remember reading this, Psalm 119, verse 165. They, those, they that are easily offended do not love your law. I just wrote in my little mind, I said, if I love God's law, I will not be easily offended. Be a lover of God's word. Be a lover of Jesus. Be a forgiver. Be a person purposing in your mind to run this race and complete it. And to experience the joy of going through this life of many difficult twists and turns and tears in your eyes and you get to the end and one day you'll be standing in his presence. And then you'll say, it was worth it all. It was worth it all. But you're here this morning. Maybe you're in a crisis. Is that you? Just raise your hand. I want to pray with you today. You're in a crisis right now. Just raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. Yeah. Some of you. See, I got my hand up. You know, people think, oh, the pastor, he never has a crisis. Listen, when you were on the front lines and fighting a war, bullets are flying. The more effective and fruitful you become in your Christian life, the more intense the warfare becomes. I'm going to be honest. That's true. And you know what? I feel like we are just moving forward. We are. Oh, there's opposition. There's battles. There's this. There's that. And I know where it's coming from. From the other side. And it just makes me want to just dig in and get stronger. Amen? So I'm not telling you something I'm not experiencing. This is real, folks. I've been here many times. And Jesus is faithful. I want us to lay down our burdens right now. So you have a burden in your heart. 
Maybe there's a concern for somebody else. Just take your hands out of your pockets for a minute. Just open your hands and put them down like I've got them and say, Lord, I'm laying my burdens down right now. I'm laying my pain down. I'm laying my crisis down. I'm laying my anxious thoughts down. I'm laying my sorrows down. I'm laying these down because I know that you're going to pick them up. You're going to carry me through this season, and I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to get stronger in my faith in you, my confidence in you. You're going to strengthen me. You're making me more like you. You're in a transforming process. We are struggling in that little cocoon. God is changing us. Do you know that transformational point where we're struggling in the cocoon? God is allowing it to happen for a purpose because he's transforming you and he's making you more like him. He's making you to trust him more and more. He's bringing you through. Boy, I tell you, Job did have no idea what was going on, but God brought him through. God brought him through, and he blessed him at the end, greater than he was before. He became a different person, a better person. He was a good person, but he became better. God's going to bring you through, so let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you're going to bring us through. I thank you that you're strengthening us. I thank you that you're transforming us. I thank you that we can put uh, our faith in you. I thank you that we can have our eyes on you and not the problems, not the storms, not the difficulties, not our pain, not our brokenness, not the challenges that are lying around us. But Lord, our eyes are fixed on you and our confidence is in you today. And we thank you for bringing us through. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you leave this morning. Thanks so much for joining us today. We encourage you to fill out a Get Connected card or submit a prayer request online on our website. If you have any questions about any, any of our ministries, feel free to contact us. If you're going to join us in person, I'd love to meet you in the foyer. Have a great day.